when men were to take up arms, the predominant object was the sword. When I've done sword fights in movies, I've always thought about, what are they for? Often these things were right at the point of history. They're such a part of our cultural heritage. Medieval and Renaissance blade, a profound and beautiful object handcrafted by master artisans of old. It is designed to kill. The truth of the sword has been shrouded in antiquity, and the Renaissance martial arts that brought it into being are long forgotten. The ancient practitioners lent us all they knew through their manuscripts. As gunslingers of the Renaissance, they were the Western heroes with swords. They lived and died by them. Yet today, their history remains cloaked under a shadow of legend. Before the invention of gunpowder, the sword was the weapon of the time. The sword probably has not been a relevant weapon for at least 200 years. To think that a pommel, a hand grip, a crossbar, a blade, a very simple object could hold such sway over thousands of years of human evolution, these objects have really controlled our history and where we are today. Swords have been used throughout history to defend people and land, to build nations, and to protect kingdoms from tyranny. From first century wars against Rome to the Viking and Norman conquests, sword and steel have changed the fate of kingdoms, the map of Europe, and ultimately the timeline of world history. Their essential role in preserving freedom and honor goes back far into the dim mists of history. The connection between sword and freedom may perhaps find its origin within the customs of the Germanic and Celtic tribes. Here, being armed with a sword was not only a right, but also a duty of all free men. In fact, the ceremony for giving freedom to a slave required that the former slave be presented with the armament of a free man. Many British kings chose to trust their subjects with arms and to supplement the militia in times of need rather than abolish it. The idea of a free militia versus a financed army presents an interesting concept that is reflected within many of our modern films. The sword is as relevant today as a symbol as it was in ages past, being found within statues, civic emblems, and insignia both ancient and modern. It has been an ancient symbol for words spoken in truth, for purity, justice, and the spirit of God. The iconic power of the sword is everywhere within our culture, from literature to popular entertainment, and nowhere is it more celebrated than in the modern cinema. There's a, a definite symbolism that's uh, part and parcel of every story containing a sword. The sword combines um, power, authority, and the threat of impending violence all in a prop, which might be hanging on somebody's side until the moment they draw it. I think there's something more intimate about two guys going at it with swords. To fight someone with a sword, uh, as opposed to shooting someone with a gun, I think it takes more courage. It's conflict at its most raw, where you've got two characters looking at each other eye to eye, engaging at that level, and the stakes are higher, it, it could go either way, you're right there and there, and, and the sword in many ways is an extension of that character's arm, it's, it's really a, a sharpened fist. It suddenly is a realm of, of myth, of legend, of, of heroes, of adventures. That would explain, to a large degree, the popularity of swords. They're, you know, an integral part of it. Our technology has progressed far beyond needing the sword as an object of personal defense. 
And while it's still irrelevant, don't you think it's interesting the extent to which we seem to still have the image of the sword, the concept of the sword, the symbolic importance of the sword? I mean, it's hard to turn on the television or go to the cinema, it seems, without uh, still being surrounded by swords. stories and movies contain the kind of morality and justice that we only wish we could find in the real world. I've had the honor, really, I have to say it like that, of working with Bob Anderson as my sword master. In all of the fights that I did on film as a coach and indeed as a modern fencer has undoubtedly been my life sword play. Others who have worked with him feel like I do that you always want to give 100% to live up to the choreography that he comes up with, even his presence. It's just him walking on the set, suddenly you have to pick up your game a bit, you know? Uh, the first time I met Bob Anderson was actually on the set of uh, Lord of the Rings. He turns around and introduces himself, says, well, I'm going to show you a few things that might save your life today, mate. And, um, and so he, he proceeded to show me uh, some, some basic blocking and thrusting and cutting uh, moves with the, uh, with the sword. The guy who came after him to, to show me some more says, oh, do you realize who that was? And I was, I was like, no, I don't. Well, that's Bob Anderson. Um, he, uh, you know, he used to train uh, Errol Flynn, and you know, he's worked for years in the industry. So, oh, really, is that? So, yeah. Why don't you give up? You can see I'm a better swordsman. Errol Flynn was a very talented, athletic actor who could do anything if he set his mind to it, and that's why he became a swordsman. I think is because the parts that were getting the publicity in those days sword fighting stuff, fighting at the end, and, and, you know, Douglas Fairbanks stuff, it was called in those days. Then he said, oh, and he was, he was Darth Vader. He was actually in Darth Vader's uh, uh, costume, actually doing all the, the lightsaber work. And I was like, that sort of struck a resonance with me, you know. Oh, Darth Vader, yeah. It's just a cloak and a helmet that I was underneath it all. <laughs> I did choreograph the fights. I did three of those. It was good work for me. It became the weapon of choice in that series of films. Indeed, even it seems when somebody's making a science fiction movie and off in space, they can't seem to escape from the sword. I wonder why that is. What is it? It's your father's lightsaber. This is the weapon of a Jedi Knight. Not as clumsy or random as a blast. <laughs> elegant weapon for a more civilized age. To go into the future and then think about laser swords, um, that's brilliant. Suddenly Star Wars is not just a sci-fi movie, it's also uh, a modern version of a hero legend. The Princess Bride was one of the best fights and everybody tells me it's one of the best fights I've choreographed. You seem a decent fellow. I hate to kill you. You seem a decent fellow. I hate to die. They learn to fight with left and right hand. Then why are you smiling? Because I know something you don't know. And what is that? I am not left-handed. And then they do it again when the other guy changes his, to his right hand. I'm not left-handed either. 
Johnny is about as good as you can get. He can transform what he learns from someone like me into a character. You know what you're doing, I'll give you that. Excellent form. But how's your footwork? Vigo came running in from Los Angeles. And I stuck a sword in his hand and he had to fight 20 something at almost the same day as he arrived. When they had all the stunties with their swords at the other end of the room and Vigo was standing there like, looking around like, what next? And then all of a sudden they just charged Vigo and they're like running towards him. He's like had his sword up. Apparently that was his, uh, his initiation. He, he didn't run away, so I think, I think Bob was like, okay, I think I can work with this guy. He had a lot to learn. He did, I thought he did extremely well. You know, it was hard work to prepare the fights, and it was, you know, demanding physically at times, but it was, it was mostly fun, and it was sort of like a uh, boyhood dream come true. You know, I got to really do it for real. There were real enemies, it was a real sword. It's important that the people you're working with trust you and you trust them. You effectively work out this sort of highly detailed choreography weeks and weeks in advance of, of when you actually get to do it on set. And then really the tough thing becomes about stamina, uh, especially when you're, you, you're wearing um, armor and leather and, and weighed down by all that sort of stuff. Uh, I thought it was some of the best choreography I had seen in uh, this, this type of movie. A lot of the stuff the, the stuntmen put together themselves and they did a very good job of it. He's much more than a sword master, and I think the directors have been well pleased with his collaboration. This sort of a regal, refined, cultured kind of a gentleman in the midst of all this chaos. It was an honor to work for him, and I, I learned a lot, not just about sword fighting, but just um, about being a man, about being a gentleman, about how to deal with people, and, uh, and a respect for the weapon. The swords were very well done, very attractive. John Howe's designs were superb. I really enjoyed getting involved with the, the Lord of the Rings swords because it was always a question of paring it down, of making the blade slimmer, of making it shorter, making it more real, even though we're not talking about real swords. The, the actor may turn up a year, a year and a half after you first started designing that weapon. It's therefore a great thing when you finally present the weapon to the actor. I really enjoyed working with, with Richard Taylor and all the people at, at the Wetter Workshop because they, like Bob Anderson, were sticklers for detail. The attention to detail that these guys um, devoted to items that uh, may not necessarily be visible to the camera, at least not on first viewing, but, uh, but they're there as an actor. Uh, it was wonderful to have, you know, those kind of props to, um, you know, uh, really help transport you to that, uh, that time and place. I liken our effects workshop, as are all other effects workshops around the world, to be similar to an artisan's studio of the years past. This is a gathering of an eclectic group of craftspeople working across an amazing array of different artistic skills coming together. It's a really exciting thing to be part of that. As a designer, you can draw your heart out. You can draw hundreds of, of hundreds of designs that you love, but if the man making them doesn't understand, then there's, you know, it's, it's, everyone's disappointed. We were incredibly fortunate to have a fellow named Peter Lyon, who was the metal worker, the swordsmith on the movie. And he's someone who understands what weapons and armor are, and he did these amazing blades. Forging techniques I use are, in some ways they're similar, in some ways they're different from the old techniques. With sword blades I'll start with a, a bar of spring steel, um, usually I'll cut and grind that and then if necessary forge it. We use bronze, wood, leather and various other materials that were used in period. The main difference really is that today with mass production and um, steel foundries and so on that 
we can uh, get things to a much more consistent standard and essentially they're a lot easier to get and work with. The style of the sword, the level of decoration, the ageing on it, they all tell you a bit about whether this character is a new person, whether they're an old warrior. It's a really lovely experience when the actors begin to take ownership of them. Bob very much encouraged you to be familiar with this weapon, which in some cases is your livelihood. Yes, it's only a movie, but the more you can feel like it's not a movie, the better the movie. Actors on the stage also demonstrate swordplay through real-time fight choreography. Doing it on the stage is so very difficult. They have to remember every blow. On the films, you can take a part of the fight, film it, do it once, twice, 15 times if necessary. You've got one chance on stage. But you've got to be really good to be a good stage sort of. When you've gone to the cut and it comes in with the thrust, you turn and your hand is stopped here. And as you do it, you transfer that all in one fast move. You try to hit him on the head with the, with the cross part of your sword. Now, if he hangs onto his sword, you pull him down and you hit him under the chin with the pommel. But he knows that. What he does is he lets go. Then I go to hit him. He has the advantage now. And that's where you see them in the manners. The thing that we call a glissade, which means the glide, is which leaves it straight at his belly. In the 18th century, the move still comes in for the sword play. We attack each other's chest. Chest. He comes back, I stretch him on the lunge, and the glissade could. So there is the same movement over a period of 200 years with different weapons, it still has the same intention. All those moves, you're trying to find out what the other one's doing. Now you can the glissade, and then they all join together. It's eye contact, it's distance, it's balance, it's timing, and it's intent. I was looking at Andy's eyes, I can see everything that his body's doing, but I can also see father, dad standing there, and I can see sort of 180 degrees in front of me. Again, the arm goes first. The reality, obviously, that I would plunge down or through the throat. So there won't be a second performance. So we keep the arm, the shoulder, the body looking at that's going towards the throat. And at the last moment, we turn the point. And to make it real, he then defends in such a way. Because I don't trust him. I feel that I might get hit. So I then use the dagger to make sure that the sword is actually missing. You cut. And you hit him. And you take his intestines out. Hope. The reason I don't hit him is because as I cut him, my elbow is pulling the sword back in again. The skill that that needs is just as great as the skill of killing them. There's of course, sometimes a difference of about two inches. The point of a choreography in a play or a movie is to forward the story. If it does that, it is successful. It's not designed to actually show a real fight, it's designed to show something exciting with swords. There is an, an undeniable romanticism attached to it all, and there's even the grittier films, I think, tend to steer clear of much of the mechanics of what a sword does to a human body. And it has to look good on the screen. I think, uh, you know, I honestly believe the real fight would be very short, sharp. It's not just a piece of art, though they can be appreciated that way. It's not just a piece of history because they were used for a purpose. It is an ancient weapon that was used to uh, gain or lose kingdoms. Well, there's always been fighting. 
never be enough time where there hasn't been personal combat. People were interested in combat and cared about combat from the highest to the lowest in the land, kings and princes, emperors. A sword as, as a weapon is something that pretty much everyone would have, would have owned in, in the, uh, the Anglian period, um, anyone being a, an adult male. So from top to bottom of society, personal combat was important. Few subjects have received such unfortunate neglect by historians than the martial arts of Western Europe. Although ancient kings and nobles gave the blade great credence during their time, often modern academics failed to clearly write about the reality of the blade, defining its practice as something apart from its actual use. It's quite a popular subject, the history of dueling. And you look at these books, and then one thing they never mentioned is the fighting. You know, you think this was the raison d'etre of a duel, but the one thing they never mention are the techniques of combat. It's a subject that has been ignored for the most part for centuries. Probably the world's foremost scholar on historical fencing, Dr. Sidney Anglo, broke open the subject. He said, hey, historians, you missed the boat. And I'm sure that a lot of historians still find it a kind of, not a proper subject, that it isn't something that historians should be writing about, which of course is foolish, I think it's perhaps not a very nice thing, you know, these people cutting each other to pieces and running each other through and so forth. They often killed each other, and if they didn't kill each other, they often maimed each other. Originally, fencing meant simply the art of defense, the noble science of defense. We have lots of records of there being fencing schools all over the place, and we also have records of people complaining about fencing schools and the, and the noise and the violence that were engendered. This changed bit by bit into the late 16th and into the 17th century when they became more fashionable for nobles to go to these schools and to learn how to fence. Yet today there are too few historians that fully understand the significant role of medieval masters. And so to a large extent, much of their history is lost to us. The sobering death toll of the First World War spoke plainly the truth that the romance of war was officially lost in time. The one-on-one -on -one dueling spirit of the sword could not prevail under the shadow of automatic machine gun fire with its gruesome wake of millions who were all too soon forgotten. With the increased use of firearms during the turn of the century, the slow erasure of classical sword fighting from public consciousness seemed almost inevitable. Fortunately, the romance of swordplay remained in the hearts of early filmmakers, who kept it alive through imagination and fantasy. But would the lost art of sword defense ever truly be reborn? It was a change from battlefield techniques and, and fighting skills for judicial combat and for a private duel and for street-level self-defense to essentially gentlemen having private affairs of honor, identical sword, single sword against single sword. Most, most duels back in the day were not to the death. They were just two-first blood. During the 1700s, you had guns beginning to supplant the sword as the uh, choice weapon for dueling. And in the mid-1800s, fencing became more and more a sport. People started, you know, playing the game instead of training to actually duel. The term fencing today is primarily synonymous with the collegiate and Olympic sport of epee, foil, and sabre. Now it's based on uh, hooking yourself up into uh, an electrical circuit and depressing tips. If you can just slip it in anywhere, as long as you slip it in on target, then it's a good touch for you. Fencing became more and more a sport. And there's a lot of aspects of fencing that are fun. Anybody who wants to learn how to use a sword should go into fencing because it teaches you the handling of the weapon. I like the honor aspect and, and the dueling history that goes along with it. Modern fencing has retained a lot of the values of Renaissance fencing in the way we, we salute before and after our bouts. The thing that I like about fencing is that uh, it allows me to do a physical but also mental sport. It's much more a thinking game than it is a physical game, despite the fact that it's a tremendously athletic endeavor. Tips of fencing blades um, go as fast as 135 miles an hour. Fencers have very uh, quick reflexes, a lot of leg strength. 
you have to deal with someone attacking you before you can go. In fencing, it's, it's straightforward and back. They're used to people reacting to their moves in a particular sort of way. There's a whole language of this very highly refined sport. It's not real, though. And it's been 200 or 300 years of evolution away from people nicking one another or cutting one another or killing one another with swords. There are very specific uh, penalties for brutality and hitting a little bit too hard. And if the referee in control of the bout, if they thought it was with malicious intent or too hard or anything like that, you can get penalized, uh, docked points, thrown out of the tournament. You will see uh, coupes, flicks, where the electric connection on the end will score. But if you had a point, you're making a little bitty nick whereas the classical fencer would stick you. And I can get my right here and leverage him there and come in here and put it into him. I was sparring with some friends who were fencers, and as he lunged, I slapped the blade aside with my left hand and extended my right and stabbed him. And he said, you can't do that. And I said, but I just did. I can engage it, take it out this way. Then he said, but that's illegal. And I said, I'm not interested in legalities, I'm trying to kill you. They have no problem grabbing you by the waist and knocking you to the ground and then beating you over the head with your sword. He does a lunge, happy. Okay. I'm going to kick that leg out from him. And I'm going to half throw my right here. Now, this wouldn't occur to a fencer. Fencing masters, my fencing coaches, would say, well, yeah, you can't do that. You can't grab his blade, you can't kick him, you can't trip him, you can't push him. People were dumb in the 1100s. They had you know, their own styles or whatever, but they were much more all-encompassing in terms of combat than this kind of fencing is. You don't think of this as fighting. There's a lot of aspects of fencing that are fun, but you can't take their rules and things too seriously because they just don't work in a straight fight. The evolution of fencing is rather simple. Historical swordplay transitioned to classical fencing upon the advent of the gun. Over the past century, sport, or Olympic fencing, was developed from classical fencing. Modern sport fencing is not necessarily an advancement of historical European martial arts, but rather a pruning down from older, more inclusive fighting systems. In time, proper decorum and stylized posture came to replace combat utility. And by the 19th century, Fighting men no longer needed to learn and use diverse arms and armor, and had fewer occasions to employ such skills. Not surprisingly, what was not modified and adapted from the wider craft consequently withered and died. As they pursued a far more specialized form of gentlemanly fencing, directed towards duels of honor with single identical swords, they came to dismiss and sometimes even ridicule older fencing skills. At the same time, fencing became more sport-focused, and in the 19th century, it increasingly lost its military or self-defense value. Those who continued to duel did so under less and less lethal terms. The popular myth of crude and clumsy medieval swords slowly evolving into more superior thrusting swords began to surface at this time. Ancient European martial arts were now officially lost in time. If you look at our society, there are a large number of subcultures, from reenactment from Revolutionary War to even reenactment of World War II. It's interesting in that it puts the human being back in to where he should be, into the middle of it. It's an interesting way to study history, and it's a lot more fun than sitting there with a book. <laughs> this is Nepe Blade. This is what we originally started using for fencing in the SCA. It's the same type of blade that's used in strip fencing that you would see at the colleges. The strip fencing is more of a sport. It's not really dedicated to the medieval martial arts of the sword. What I have here looks more like a real sword. It's heavier, but it's still designed to be safe to bend without breaking. It has more of the weight of a real medieval sword. 
so we can start to use the techniques as they would have been used in the Middle Ages with a proper weighted weapon. Well, it's a wide spectrum of things. It goes from people dressed as orcs to very serious um, people who weave their own cloth. There is an individual fulfillment that the individual becomes somebody more than just a small cog in a large plastic machine. Historical reenactment folks have got their own culture. It's an amazing thing. It's great to be in, but it's a, it's a whole gestalt for them. It's a, it's, it's a whole lifestyle for them. What we do is to create a persona, each of us who joins. My name is Greg Prevost in the real world. In the SCA, I'm known as Janos of Kitten and Downs, which is Welsh, and it's hard to spell. You create the clothing, the equipment for that person, and you become that person at the events. Uh, you take the name Akbar Ibn Ali. Uh, that name actually derives uh, from Andalusian Spain, so it's Moorish. Uh, my title in the SCA is King Currently, but I'm also a knight in the SCA. Once you get knighted, you're knighted for life. So it's like a lifetime achievement award. This is a very family-oriented uh, society. Uh, everyone's welcome. I have four children, and all of them have been to their first event when they were weeks or months old. Uh, my oldest son is 11 now, and I'm starting to teach him how to fence. We don't chop each other in this sport. There's a thrust, and there is a draw cut. Every kingdom is ruled by a king and queen. They are chosen by combat. All the fighters come forward and they have a, a two out of three, best two out of three elimination tournament. You call the wound as accurately as you can what it would have done to you if it had been a real sword. For instance, if you get hit a legal blow in your leg, you then have to drop to your knees and fight from the ground, which compromises your mobility quite a bit. Um, your opponent has the option of being chivalrous and also taking the same uh, handicap so that the match continues to be equal, but he doesn't have to. It's on his honor. If he does agree to accept that handicap, then he's lauded by the, by the audience for, for his chivalry. If I got hit with a solid blow that would have been killing if it was in a real sword, I will act out that death. We don't say that we're dead. We say that we are disinclined to continue. People see us fight from a distance, at first they think of medieval times, scripted for the entertainment of people watching. The SCA is completely different. It is an actual sport. We're competing. Every blow thrown out there is thrown with real force. We don't know who, when we step on the field, will win. And we don't know who will be the next king until the last uh, blow is thrown in the tournament. It's just a different spin-off of the same basic history. The creative part is we take the best parts of the Middle Ages and we try to recreate them. The beauty, the pageantry. We leave behind the plague and the death. <laughs> I think that reenactment is an interesting and valid, if you like, approach to, um, approach to history. It can be a very rich, rich, rich source of, uh, of information. It's also a little bit dangerous because reenactment is now becoming part of history itself, which, which troubles me quite a bit. When you take a pipe and you, and you wrap it with some padding and you, and you whack on one another, that's no different from reality than we who fence with electronic gear that lets us know whether or not a touch would have happened. The swords are actually sharp. Most of these guys really wouldn't be doing this, and I wouldn't be either. There are many martial arts within the Asian culture. Out of China, you have Manta style, Tiger style, Eagle style, Wing Chun. From Korea, you have Taekwondo, Tangsudo, Sobakdo, Kwanbap, Taekyeon, Hapkido, Yudo, Gamdo, Gamsul. Out of Japan, you have the very familiar karate, Judo, Kendo. Out of the Philippines, you have the Screma or Arnis. Out of Thailand, you have Muay Thai. Out of Burma, you have Bando. And I'm sure there are many, many others. When you hit a target area, you have to say where you're hitting. So, head, wrist, side. Just coming in and hitting is not considered a point. I have to have proper etiquette. I have to make a pronounced step. I have to hit the proper part of my sword, which is in between this leather piece and this leather piece. I have to either go forward or backward. 
my body, my mind, and my sword have to be all in unison. The idea is you're becoming one with your weapon. So, I'm a Mukashkara no Kenjitsuga, Kendo, Chikatachi, Ukatsugera, Tero Nakatene, Mukano Tashkani, so, Kimerata Basho, Yori Hayaku, Ute, Katsu, Yukotoane, Kendo, and Tote, Kasenai, but Mono and the Skatomo. In the 70s and the 80s, movies increased our interest in Asian martial arts. It wouldn't fly spot be easier. Man who catch fly with chopstick accomplish anything. Today, when people hear the term martial arts, they immediately bring to mind fighting arts from the East, such as karate and taekwondo. There's a more esoteric concept to kill someone efficiently. That, that is more than just killing someone. And that, in my opinion, is absent within the, um, the Western uh, sorting styles as opposed to Eastern. <laughs> そう in many respects, you can say the West had the same attitude that uh, the Japanese had, but we handled it differently. So there's nothing really different in these things. We have a tendency to forget that the West had their own tradition of martial arts as well. European fighting skills tend to sort of get relegated to something that was really sort of crude and basic, which it wasn't. What's funny is they don't seem to remember that the human body is the same the world over. And it depends on how your body moves, and that's governed by body mechanics. It's somewhat amusing to have uh, a devotee of the uh, Oriental Martial Arts glancing through a, a European manual on, say, wrestling, a hand-to-hand -hand combat, and say, oh, wow, this is done almost like the Japanese. Things from Asia and Japan are viewed as being the sort of pinnacle of fighting skills. And you know, as skillful as they were, we were just as skillful here. What we did was we forgot about it. If you're comparing the two, look how quickly the West uh, seized on the fowler and made great use of it. Whereas in Japan, it was used for a brief period of time until once the Tokugawa shogunate was established, they were banned because this would destroy the social culture. When a, a peasant could blast the samurai from 50 yards away, uh, it was unthinkable. Martial arts from the East are very hierarchical, being orally transmitted from one person to the next. Pretty much it was a hereditary thing. So you had to be born a samurai, so it was essentially father to son, master to disciple. And of course, the big difference is that schools, some of the oriental schools continued to flourish. How far they're teaching exactly the same sorts of things that they taught in the past is like anybody to guess. You remember the game where you, you whisper and then you whisper to the next. By the time it gets to the end, the, the thought is all different. Eastern martial arts have a long and continuous history where in the West, martial arts, with the sword in particular, died down a lot after the Renaissance. As the gun improved, the sword was relegated and became less and less important. People stopped training and teaching in the old arts. There was no necessity, no need to learn these things anymore. 
So we have a, essentially a break in the history of the sword in the Western world. What was the sword and how was it used? Before practical sword play developed into a gentleman's ritual of single dueling, masters of defense flourished across Europe. Many of the surviving manuscripts detailing their combative systems remained largely obscure for centuries until now. Today, historical fencing studies are on the rise and an unprecedented revival of these extinct combative systems is now underway. had its own martial arts tradition exactly as the, as, as the Orient did, exactly the same. There's been a renaissance, so to speak, in the study of the sword, offering us a lot of insight that had been lost in the several hundred years since the sword was truly relevant to combat. The work of uh, people in making very accurate recreations of the sword in terms of form as well as the manner in which they would handle. And then those martial artists who are taking these accurate recreations, moving them in space and working out what was possible and what isn't possible. All across Europe, the Americas and around the world, Historical European fight clubs have emerged with a desire to study the original combative systems of both Europe and the ancient world. They have set out to practice with a different kind of energy and intensity, separate from the reenactment and sport fencing groups. We're trying to discover something that's always been there and has been forgotten. And uh, it's a lot of work to obviously to, to try to understand what was lost. It's a part of our history in Europe, and uh, I think that's very important. This is actually our, our history. This is actually how we fought. Historical European martial arts is the study of Europe's traditional fighting systems. I'm doing this because I had previously studied Asian martial arts, and I wanted to study martial arts related to my own culture and the place that I'm from. Martial arts from, from Japan or China or Southeast Asia, valid as they are, I wanted something that was for my culture and for me. I came from a long background of doing martial arts myself. I wanted to see how the modern arts compared to the old arts. And it seems that their understanding was every bit as complicated as ours, and possibly more so. If you look at modern sport fencing, kendo and the like, they've actually become simplified versions of these great complex systems which were utterly ruthless. It's our past, it's part of our culture, I think. Today, historical European martial arts groups are reclaiming the ancient fighting techniques and studying the diversity of arms and armor. For me, I think the sword is like what it was in the medieval time. What matters is the man on the other side. The difference between the medieval sword and the Japanese sword is that the Japanese put their soul into the sword. In medieval time, what matters was to put the other man into the sword. There's no, no such thing as just a sword. It's a weapon for killing people, and I'm learning how to do it efficiently. To me, the sword is... Uh... Cool. For centuries, these ancient fighting skills have not been practiced. Historical fencing students 
are now learning to reconstruct martial arts that have been, until now, extinct. We're having to try and rediscover what the uh, fight masters of the time were thinking and how they formulated their techniques and how they evolved. So there's quite a strong academic uh, side to it in the Western martial arts. We're essentially resurrecting this from books. Just as European scholars wrote down every other art and science, the science of defense was also documented and recorded. Many of the old fighting manuals and treaties that were written during the 15th and 16th centuries have recently been rediscovered and are now being studied worldwide. We focus on mainly on German manuals, but also Italian manuals, 15th century and 16th century. My personal favorite is Talhofer. For the most part, the Italian books, the German books, and the Spanish books on the fighting arts had been forgotten. Hidden in old libraries and monasteries, in old archives and universities. Unfortunately, very little research had been done on them. For the most part, they had not been looked at for hundreds of years. Today, these old texts are once again being systematically studied and the ancient fighting skills are being reborn. In the text, the old masters actually request that the students study the source literature. And in one instance, they ask that they add to the text, bringing their own ideas to it and expanding upon it. These arts existed in, in various forms because they evolved uh, together hand in hand with, with the societies that created them. There's nothing equivalent to that in any of the other world's traditional martial arts. They don't have the volumes of technical literature that we have. This is our Western tradition. A lot of people learn martial arts from people who learned it from somebody else. So oftentimes it's many generations removed from someone with real combat experience. These books, are, they're written by the source. There's a plate in Wallerstein specifically where the caption says something like the swordsmen have captured each other's swords. And I thought, oh, that would never happen in a fight. And that following week, I was in a bind with a guy who spun out and there we were standing just like the plate showed. And so that all of a sudden becomes like a direct link back to that time. How did they communicate their systems to absent third party. There's this combination of words and images where you have a kind of notation where you can almost read the movements like you read music. It combines a, a ground plan, the way your, your feet go, a representation of how you hold the weapon. You can see the relationship between the swords, horizontally as well as vertically, because it casts a shadow and of course scores of postures. They're all an attempt to convey what the author wants his student to understand. This is the source literature. This is what's going to tell us how they did it back then, and this is how we should be doing it again today. When one looks at books on arms and armor, the incredible detail and diversity of design in such weaponry is apparent. Therefore, it stands to reason that there should be an equally sophisticated manner of using such weapons. I was inspired by the works of a gentleman named Ewart Oakeshott. Oakeshott was considered the world's leading authority on European swords, on medieval swords in particular. Most academics look on them as quaint curiosities, but they have no real concept of what that sword was used for or even how it was used. Hewart made it into what it was. These were weapons made for young men to kill other young men a real weapon used by real people. The typology of the sword that Ewart Oakeshott devised included a classification for all historical blades. Oakeshott's classifications unlocked the mythical doors that had obscured the true history of European martial combat. I think if you look at any Anglo-Saxon grave, for example, or Viking graves, or ordinary warriors might have a knife, long knife and a spear and a shield, but they don't have the sword. There are very few swords in comparison to the number of axes or spearheads. Spearheads and axes a blacksmith can make. You have to be a swordsmith to get the technology to be able to make a sword. 
I feel a real connection to the ancient Smiths because I like doing it with the tools that they had, with the fuels that they had, with, with just clay and water, and a hand hammer and charcoal. I have a modern shop too. I've got air hammers and gas forges and electric kilns, which I use for experimentation and making sure that what I think is happening the ancient way is actually happening with some modern tests. What really attracted me was the chemistry. I said, well, how did they make this stuff from, from iron sand? or dirt, basically. Uh, it's, it's kind of magical. And the more I learned about it, the more I realized there was different ways that different cultures did it. So I had to try that. But I don't like just reading about it and putting a book on the shelf. I want to do it until I get it right, which causes a whole lot of sleepless nights and a lot of work and, and a lot of trial and error. I feel that a collector like myself does uh, at least have some utility to those attempting to rediscover the sword. I can provide uh, swordsmiths such as Paul the opportunity to make very careful measurements of some of the uh, original swords which have survived. Rediscovering the way in which they were put together to give great performance even with materials and techniques that are primitive by today's technological standards. Well, sometimes there's a debate, you know, is the Japanese sword better than the Chinese sword? Well, the Chinese taught the Japanese their technique, so basically it's just a refined Chinese sword. Well, no, the European swords are better. No, roots, which, you know, Indian type blades are, are better. I've been working a lot of these traditions and I'm finding more similarities of how they solve their problems than I am finding differences. And they have different ways of doing them and different ways to stack things. Some people use twists, some cultures didn't use twisted steel, but they solve the problems in a very similar fashion. And that really intrigued me. I figured out some things that were wrong in books, and things that weren't written in books, and, and other things that were, I feel, are right, by actually doing them and trying them and testing the swords and breaking the swords and lots of things. I enjoy getting primary knowledge. There's not too many people that smelt their own steel and then test their own blades and make full finished pieces from them. But where I feel the connection is sitting back there with the fire going and pumping the bellows with everything quiet and just me and forging that blade. In 2006, a suitcase in the attic of a well-loved and deceased archaeologist was literally saved from history's dustbin. The treasure inside? A sword, 13 centuries old. Since then, the sword has been tested extensively by the Royal Armouries and the Bamber Research Project in an effort to unlock the secrets of this rare object's hidden past. This is one of the most significant swords found by Brian Hook Taylor in his 1960s excavation. It remained in his possession up until his death in 2001, at which point it came back to the castle. When you hold it today, it has an almost mystical quality to it. It looks like a corroded lump of metal, but in its glory, this would have been a, a, an awe-inspiring sight. The x-rays revealed it to be an extraordinarily sophisticated piece of technology. It proved to be an incredibly important weapon, one of the most important weapons, I think it's fair to say, ever found in Britain. It's actually composed of its central core of six strands of iron which are worked and twisted and welded together. And on the edge of that is added a steel seventh element, if you like, and a technique called pattern welding. An iron core with a forge welded steel edge. So you get the flex and, and strength of the iron with the extreme cutting power of the steel. Which is incredibly tough and quite springy and flexible, so it won't break very easily. You'd rather have a sword softer, take a set, take a bend, than break. If there's a broken sword in your hand during a battle, you're dead. I wouldn't want to be the smith that the customer came back to with his brother's broken sword in his hand, going, hey, why'd you make this so brittle? If a warrior were to go into battle with a sword that was excessively hard and brittle, the battle for him could be very short indeed. There's only a handful like this in the world, probably four or five in the entire world. The experts we've talked to, and the, the, the British Museum um, and the, the Royal Armouries, 
don't know of a single example of a six-stranded sword prior to this one being identified, which does suggest that they are um, something of this technological sophistication is staggeringly rare. If you were to actually have looked in the home of a medieval warrior or a warrior in another culture of a century or two ago, often the sword would have really you know, represented the most technologically advanced item in the house. It represents the, the epitome of technology, of weapons technology of its age. It is, I suppose, in, in, a, in a modern analogy, something like a stealth fighter. The one thing I can say with certainty is that it's very, very difficult to make one of these. You wouldn't let a smith who knew the secrets of making a sword like this wander about. They would have been kept closely guarded by the king the information would have been an incredibly jealously guarded secret. The process is very long and very arduous and requires an incredible level of skill. He would have been, had a, a mastery of metals. He would have known exactly when to take it from the fire, when, which bits to forge, how hard to hit it, when to hit it, more importantly, when not to hit it. One single blow can shatter a blade like this easily if it's at the wrong temperature. Literally tens of thousands of hammer blows have to be right. When you manufacture a blade like this, you don't just make it, you live it, and you dream about it, and you think about it every single moment. It would often reflect the very best craftsmanship and some of the best applied art of that culture. I'm generally trying to see how all the pieces were put together, because pattern welding is quite a complicated process. That would have been translated into a to a 3D reconstruction on the computer of how it was put together. There is a cleanliness of line and an economy of weight to make it efficient, durable, as light as possible. I'm continually impressed to no end about how beautiful all these objects are. High-end warriors and kings who can do what they want with precious metals and, and precious stones, the idea that they don't need to because the sword itself is so precious, I think, speaks volumes. There must have been quite a lot of thought on the part of the, um, you know, the regular soldier to actually preserve the blade from damage. Simply to employ a person of the caliber of the individual who made this would have cost a fortune. It would have cost an absolute fortune. If you look at old swords, you can tell which ones have had to be used to parry or bone break. You can tell bone breaks too. It's actually notched and, and chipped uh, along both sides, which does suggest that it has been used repeatedly in battle. A sword of this quality would have, have been owned by someone who was incredibly important. It was probably owned by one of the kings of Northumbria, possibly by several of them, which does suggest two or three hundred years of use. So it may well have been a, a, an heirloom of the Northumbrian royal house passed down from generations, basically one king to another. A sword like this, I think, would have inspired absolute terror. When you're in battle and you see a sword of this quality coming towards you, you would know immediately that the person who wielded a sword like this was someone who had spent their entire life training to be a warrior, who lived their life by the sword. Contrary to popular notions, the medieval longsword is surprisingly light, weighing an average of only three pounds and capable of blindingly fast attacks. Sword combatants use both footwork and the ability to manipulate timing and distance to enhance the sword's cutting and thrusting capabilities. One of the primary principles of swordplay is to attack and defend at the same time, where every attack contains a defense and every defense contains a counterattack. Picking up a sharp implement and cutting someone, you know, you can teach that very quickly. However, the strategy behind it, when to attack, when not to attack, that, that is a very mental pursuit. The subtle movements, the deceptions, the trickery, where I look over here, move, and strike someplace else. 
when you start uh, fencing with medieval swords, then you discover that, that it's more to it than actually using just a blade. There's different angles and uh, a lot of things that it's not obvious for, for the normal person <laughs> in using the sword. Levering with the sword to try to disarm the other guy, fasting with the cross, Historical European martial artists believe that it is important to study and practice the techniques with great energy and intensity. From the manuals, we can see the diversity of the ancient master's skills. They studied two weapon combinations, sword with shields, swords with buckler, and swords with daggers. Often they considered unarmored as well as armored fighting mounted as well as on foot. Generally, the ancient masters always integrated armed and unarmed skills, never practicing fencing without also including grappling and wrestling techniques. Most of these combats probably ended on the ground. When he's down on the ground, and I'm using all my weight to shove my sword through him, then I can penetrate. In order to comprehend the sword, you need to comprehend all the techniques, techniques surrounding the actual use of swords. Contrary to what you see at rent fairs and what you see in Hollywood movies, armored fighting is not about using the edge of the sword. It's not going to penetrate that breastplate or that plate leg armor, so I have to come up with another way of defeating a man in armor. And that method is primarily half sword The manuals are full of this technique. I grab my own blade and I use it as a thrusting weapon. I can shorten the blade by doing this and make it much stiffer so they have accuracy and enough strength to penetrate his armor. I have to thrust it in and put some weight behind it and really drive it. Fencing does not allow you to use the left hand. And I have heard people tell you or say that the left hand is for balance. It has nothing to do with balance. We're constantly going to be using this hand. So when he makes an attack, if I have to, I'll use elbow, forearm, anything I use. Now, in classical fencing or dueling manuals, you see slapping the blade as a constant thing. In fact, you will see them most of the time with the left hand up here in a position to slap. He makes a thrust. I have to get to here, I'm going to disarm him. You have to do free play. You have to do intense amount of combat. And you have to do it with as realistic a way as possible. Today, uh, we do a lot of sitting. You know, we, we sit in front of our computers, we, we sit in front of our televisions, we sit on the way to, to work, and then we get to work and we sit, and then we go home and sit again, and then we're laying down. In the medieval Renaissance era, people didn't. They did a lot of walking, and a lot of riding, and a lot of running. I think we have no idea how much like rawhide these people must have been back in, you know, five or six centuries ago. I think we're very soft nowadays, despite our efforts to, to remain, you know, fit. I was a sword knight at 12, so me and one of my friends went out and we immediately, bang, 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 started fencing with them. And after I was over with, I had two hacksaws <laughs> because, you know, it just ruins the edge. Well, I was shocked and upset because this wasn't what happened in the movies. Movie combat is a curi really a curious undertaking because it's, it's not very realistic, generally. It doesn't portray how the we these historical weaponry actually performs and handles. 
it's one of my favorite themes actually that, that that metallic noise that a sword makes coming out of a out of a scabbard which makes no sense swords don't make a noise when they come out you know it's like life is a fantasy that doesn't reflect the way human beings actually behave in violent personal armed combat mainly when you see movies now, nowadays they they always focus on techniques even in in, in moves displaying in medieval europe they always focus on uh, Asian techniques and etc. And uh, that's not our way, so to speak. Western martial arts, you know, that's, you know, whether it be English, Italian, uh, French, Spanish, there are specifics to those styles and those weapons that are ignored in most of the movies these days. It's like a huge pot of soup with many, many ingredients. You know, they're hybrids, really. They're not true to Western martial arts, I wouldn't say for the most part, because they're mixing in elements of Asian martial arts that have no place there, really, if you want to be realistic. So you have a little bit of Kung Fu and a little bit of, you know, a little bit of everything. Most of the time, a lot of these movies are very good. The problem that I have with it is that a lot of people in the audience think this is the way you use a sword. It's purely for entertainment, this is true. But it certainly makes my job harder. We teach people, no, your sword's not going to cut through a guy in plate armor. No, you can't cut through, uh, cut a Z in somebody's uh, chest. But you can do other things. And they're even more interesting because they're real. Many who study classical fencing and European martial arts believe that if you give the audience more realism, combined with credible performances, then they will enjoy and embrace it. I think that now there's a generation of moviegoers and readers who are, who are ready for that and are asking for that. Classical fencers and historical European martial artists and scholars have now shown that there is a wonderful craft out there that has been lost but that can now be made to exist again. There have recently, there are some movies that has been focusing a little bit on European martial arts. Good examples of films that feature combat based on specific historical swordsmanship include Rob Roy, Gladiator, Troy, Kingdom of Heaven, and Alla Triste. In some few cases, people are more in tune and, and do a better job of researching and being true to the style of the period. As I say, Bob does this very well. For example, in Alla Triste, they're not uh, what Bob would call sword slapping scenes, you know. His goal is always uh, credibility, naturalism, fights the way they would be. And the reason that people are careful going in and they're, once they commit, they commit fully is because even a small wound in those times, infection, and you could die just from that. You're going in to kill, and it's over with very quickly. They were violent, you know, shockingly violent at times, and there were very real <laughs> dangerous consequences to uh, mixing it up with, with swords. In many regards, it is to the high fantasy of film that we are indebted for today's resurgence of Western martial arts. Movies have inspired many talented individuals to take up the sword in an effort to rediscover its true martial significance. The resurgence of authentic European martial arts has been growing exponentially over time. Over the years, it has actually become influential in cinema. Historical European martial arts are neither reenactment nor sport fencing. They are in a category all of their own. This fresh approach to training takes history into account, striving to improve both its practice and authenticity. Our lives don't depend on, on this craft. Nobody's gonna challenge us to a duel at the mall with a rapier. Nobody's gonna ambush us in a parking lot with a bastard sword. So we have to have alternative reasons for why we're doing this. We do this, I think, because it needs to be done. And hopefully it will increase everyone's understanding and awareness of how um, European warfare was conducted.
they will be appreciated for as effective and as elegant and as uh, useful as anything that the rest of the world has to offer. All these things that have been forgotten needs to be found again. In an age where truth seems so far from us, symbol of the sword shines bright. The journey it takes to become good with your blade, to become good with your sword, um, that takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, and that changes a person, matures a person. Obviously, in the process, it's going to teach you to become a better man. We hope to be, who knows, someday better swordsmen, maybe even mildly average swordsmen. That would be more than, than I would ever expect. What story can an ancient sword tell us? I, I can't say I really understand the sword as of yet, but hopefully one day I will, I will be there. Eventually I would uh, like my studies to take me to the great heights of beating my instructor, the first woman to ever do so. Sword fighting is kind of different and look like good fun, and um, I've been a couple of times and it is good fun. While those who train today have only begun to scratch the surface, they are slowly beginning to lift the shadow. You know, it's all those dreams that, uh, that you really can't have anymore because you've grown up. People are often looking backwards in time to see whereabouts we've come from. Even in the 50s, progress was happening. People were looking forward. And now we've reached a point, I think, where we're looking all around, trying to find meaning to what's happening. People need to feel that sense of identity with their past and with their history. There's nothing richer than history. History is, you know, history is all of us over thousands of years. I've been doing martial arts for over 20 years now. I've noticed my body changing and I'm getting older and things are a little bit more difficult. However, I don't give up on that. I train myself harder so it becomes very, very mental. Your body goes away, but your mind should, should stay sharp. So I get a bit more gray and a little more stooped as long as I can swing a hammer. Uh, I'm just going to keep doing this. Within the sword lies the power both to protect and to rule. It can be used for great evil or for great good. To control a people or stop the hordes of a tyrant. To break the rightful will of a nation or to set the truth free and every man a king over his own fate. A good swordsman does not uh take lightly unsheathing his sword. If your sword is out, it means you intend to use it. It's a pity, really, that we couldn't fight with rapiers today rather than guns. It's a pity that uh, gunpowder was invented, in my mind, because we would probably still be fighting with rapiers and I'd be good at it. <laughs>